Stephen Jones, you know, professor of physics at Brigham Young University, had had all but basically helped shut down um, the research into cold fusion. Two distinguished chemists, Dr. Martin Fleischmann and Dr. Stanley Pons, announced to the amazement of the world that they had detected a nuclear-like reaction that could turn water into a powerful new fuel. Their discovery became known as cold fusion because, they said, it delivered fusion energy like that produced in the sun without emitting deadly radiation. The U.S. Department of Energy, or DOE, convened a review panel in April of 1989. By mid-July, the DOE panel had completed their damning report. Data affirming vital aspects of the discovery was published in reputable journals. But the presiding agenda of official science, the science of money and politics, drowned the truth in accusations of impropriety and outright fraud. When it was first said, uh, by Fleischmann and Pons that cold fusion existed. This went all the way up to the president, and the president appointed uh, a special committee of 22 excellent scientists to investigate it. And these scientists announced that they were going to U-turn to other laboratories to try and see what was happening. But every time they went to this laboratory, by some miracle, none of the cells worked at this time. The governors of official science declared war on cold fusion. Was the promise of cold fusion too good to be true? Or was it trampled on by clothed-minded, greedy power brokers whose special interests outweighed the public good? Prior to the 1989 announcement, Stephen E. Jones, a physics professor at nearby Brigham Young University, learned of Pons and Fleischmann's work through an informant at the DOE. In a flagrant example of shameless opportunism, Jones insisted on going public quickly with his comparatively much less clear results. Disparaging the excess heat claims of Fleischmann and Pons, Jones' announcement would have effectively prevented the two scientists from patenting their process, a process they had developed on their own over long years of research. On the advice of university attorneys, Pons and Fleischmann, feeling their backs to the wall, reluctantly delivered their work to public scrutiny. Though their discovery posed a very clear challenge to the energy industry, it was the scientific community, mostly physicists, which raised the specter of doubt and wrongdoing. Um, Stephen Jones was, was asked to review the Pons and Fleischmann um, request of the Department of Energy back in 1988. And it was considered somewhat unethical what he was doing because typically somebody who's actually receiving money in the field um, that it's being requested for yeah, the conflict of interest out. It's yeah. a conflict of interest. Absolutely. And he went ahead and did it anyway. And so he, he had, had all the information. Unethical. Absolutely. And he had all the information of what they were doing, how they were conducting uh, I thought this man was a, a, a religious man. Is he somehow finding there's no connection between his religious beliefs and his, his ethical practice or lack thereof? That's rather it, stunning it, it to me. It makes you wonder how hypocritical a person could be if, if they are acting in that way. MIT's Hot Fusion Center, a federally funded facility, was among the loudest voices to disparage the work of Pons and Fleischmann. Ironically, upon re-examination of their results, disturbing inconsistencies appeared. MIT's raw data provided clear evidence of excess heat, but in MIT's official report, the graph was altered to reflect no excess heat. Engineer Dr. Eugene Maloff, chief science journalist at MIT, resigned in protest. That's what I thought originally. In the case of MIT, it was a disaster. These people, before even analyzing their calorimetry data, held a party for the death of cold fusion. And then they manipulated the data to make a positive result look negative. Their results don't prove cold fusion, but they certainly had a positive result. What I found was a number of books, particularly one by Eugene F. Malov, um, called Fire from Ice, Searching for the Truth Behind Cold Fusion. And this book, to, to give a little perspective, was written back in 1991. So it was all well before anything related to 9-11. Um, I mean, all of the perspective was based on that one particular topic. And there are just numerous, time after time, various uh, 
key notes in the book related to Dr. Jones' involvement in that whole uh, situation and how cold fusion became, you know, a household name that everybody just, you know, said was the most crazy, ridiculous thing ever heard. And it, and it was the involvement of, of several different scientists as well as the United States government that kind of threw that into the limelight as far as that cold fusion was crazy, it was pathological science, and all kinds of ad hominem attacks were being made against um, doctors Pons and Fleischmann. And do I understand there are a variety of weird events related to all uh, the Melov uh, research, including that, that someone who was associated with it was murdered, or was it he himself? Well, Eugene Melov was, was murdered in 2004. And the, the details surrounding it, you know, pertain to a couple of thugs that, you know, were trying to rob him or something like that while he was cleaning a, a, an old rental property um, that used to be his parents' and his childhood home. A couple of thugs were trying to rob him? Yes. That's exactly um, parallel to what happened to Michael Zemer in 2006. And you have to make you have to make that connection. It's like you know, even even though you, the details are are obscured to us, it's like how coincidental is it that it's exact same uh, situation? And of course, uh, Michael Zebra was doing research with Judy Wood on on aluminum, on molten aluminum, and uh, you know, it was a fertile source of a, of empirical research here to support the inference that when you're looking at that streaming fluid coming out of the 80th floor that it could have been molten aluminum as much as it could have been molten steel but I'm personally convinced that it was neither almost certainly it had to be molten lead for the reasons I've already articulated now I'd, I'd hate to think that Michael Zebra was being murdered as, as Malov appears to have been because of his research but it's not it, it can't be ruled out well when when you have the fear of, of all the money that you're making in the military industrial complex as well as the fact that, you know, anybody that is ever eventually brought to to um, account for this this massive crime and, and deception of, of the world, I mean, there's a lot riding on it. And, you know, for folks to be starting to get close or appear to get close, um, Makes you, makes you wonder if there is a parallel there. Now, is it also the case that your research has led you to investigate connections or links between Stephen Jones, the Department of Energy, Los Alamos? I mean, I get the well, impression that an awful lot of those, there, there like this guy Greg Jenkins, who seems to come out of nowhere, somehow have ties to the Department of Energy in Los Alamos, too. Is there a, is there a, a group connection here? Well, on, on page 109 of his book, um, it talks about the research that, that Jones was doing back in the early 80s. Um, he and his comet colleagues in 1982 undertook a major experimental effort, and they were doing it at the Los Alamos Mason Physics Facility, and they were under the sponsorship of the Department of Energy's Richard Gashevsky. So right there in about two lines in his book, he ties them all the way through. And it's, it's very consistent that they are they are involved with Los Alamos and the Department of Energy, which means you also have the oil companies and the government involved. So and potentially high-tech weapons of the kind that might have been used on 9-11. The real innocent researcher or the person that wants to get at the truth, I mean, they need to go out and actually read for themselves. They need to look at the various websites and, and make up their own decision because when someone tells you how to think, what to what to look at, and what not to look at. You you have to act like a teenager at that point and say, well, if they're telling me what to do, I'm going to do just the opposite. And what that is is look at everything, make up your own mind.